Yeah, so why do you guys decide to come? Pretty interesting low level kind of programming oh, yeah. operating system. Kind of. Do you like C or anything? Alright, sweet. How are you? Uh, I'm just getting started programming. So I don't know much. Okay. Not sure what hey, you might like this thing because it's pretty high level. It's not, we're not going to go too deep in the code. We might be a little bit at the end. We're going to keep it as high level as possible. And like at the end, you can like come ask us questions if you want to know low level. And this is sort of like a semi advertisement for the club. So if you're interested in joining and doing low level stuff, you can. What do you guys need? Uh, we need Friday's now this time. So after the day, like every single week, 1 o'clock, I think in this room or the room next to us. So like in the general area. Okay. Um, what you come? I mean, similar to what he was saying, I was interested in the low level like the 88, so. You should be, because you're a graduate student. I already know why you came, so. Right. And everyone else is here. Yeah, why are you guys here? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I joined the homebrew club because I'm interested in breaking things. I always, I always kind of imagine myself um, kind of leaking out the latest and newest things about hardware coming out, and I'm interested in. Yeah, it's making my own stuff, so learning how to break things is essentially that. Yeah, so you can understand things pretty much. Yeah. Jeez, if we're doing that, <laughs> what did you join? The vice president, I made him come with you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't join. I, I made him join. <laughs> we created this thing. Uh, uh, Joshua. Okay, I came because, like, um, I heard it was good that, like, side projects in college, like, you won't fall too behind and, like, you'll get something out of it. And, like, I, like, as a kid, like I used to play a rock, like a lot of rock hacks. So I wanted to like get started in it and actually figuring out it was like a little too much for like the fifth grader to understand. Yeah. Like, yeah, I want to get more experience about stuff like this and like critical engineering and like have something to accompany my CS major. So. It's pretty good. Huh? You're like way ahead of me than I was when I was. Oh, Randy, you're last. <laughs> Why did you join? I have no, no you idea it. why I made this class. <laughs> it was like impulse, basically. I mean, so you just woke up one day and said, "Hey, I'm doing the go home." Nah, we were uh, <laughs> we were hanging out talking about. We're gonna make a tea club, actually. Yeah, we started with a tea. A tea. Yeah. Uh, like, no lie. And uh, we wanted to get funding for tea. So we didn't want to buy our. We wanted free money for the school. Yeah, basically, we wanted free money for the school. Um, and, it was an app, so and it turned into this, like us actually doing extracurricular work to help us further our careers and whatnot. You know, they really. <laughs> I'm a little confused how you guys look from tea to like freaking <laughs> homebrew, but. <laughs> <laughs> tea, brew, brew, brew. Oh, oh, tea, and we just decided to brew computers. Right, I'm stupid. Alright. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I guess we're going to get started in a sec. Uh, just so you guys know, like, you want this to be more of like a. Uh, a round table like narrative kind of thing, so we don't want to be like talking at you guys this whole time. So if you have something you want to say, or like any questions or whatever, you can just like say whatever, and then any of you guys, by saying something stupid, you can like. Um, so yeah, I did any of you even know what the homebrew computing club like originally was? I didn't know that's what it was called. It was like um, it was called the Hacker Club at first, right? What did you think it was called? I didn't think it was a club at all. I thought it was a talk, so. Oh, like this thing. Oh, well, <laughs> so the computer club is actually like historical. Um, like in like around like the 80s, where the computer revolution was getting started, it was like this big community thing where all these people were like super interested in computers. Like everything was really expensive at the time, so if you wanted to build your own computer, you kind of had to like do swap meets and stuff like that. And then people would like build computers together with their various parts, then people would like write software for other people's stuff and like share their software. So it was a really cool, like fun thing. And there's like a lot of notable, you know, successful peep engineers who were a part of this club. Uh, Steve Wozniak is one of them. So I mean, just to name drop, but, <laughs> but yeah, we were like inspired by it. So like we kind of wanted to do the same thing, like do exploratory <coughs> projects, working together, reverse engineering. Hey, what's going on? So, I can't see you anywhere. Yeah, coffee donuts or whatever. All right. We're just getting started. We're saying like who we were. So, um, do you guys know what the Homebrew Computing Club was? The what? All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is an actual club. This isn't like a, a talk thing. Yeah. Okay. Good. We're a club, by the way. Yeah. We're a student <laughs> organization. Um, the Homebrew Computing Club was like originally a thing in like the '80s that a bunch of people interested in like, engineering. Uh, like we get together and do swap meets and stuff and exchange like their parts or work on building computers together. 
and also they would like write software for each other and share and stuff like that. So it was just like a cool. People were interested in it, reverse engineering stuff, and just playing around with technology. Um, so that was pretty cool. We were inspired by that, so we made the homebrew computing club here. We're basically doing the same thing. We're reverse engineering things uh, like Space Invaders. And it's basically the ultimate goal is to understand things better. And that's basically what we are. So we every semester we take on. Uh, obviously, this last semester was our first semester. So every semester from then on, we're taking on like a new project based on what the club kind of wants to go in. We try to make it sort of open-ended so that everyone can work on it at different skill levels. Because most of this is written in C, uh, but you know, Joshua wrote a disassembler in no, Java. It's, yeah. not, it's not working out. It was working before. <laughs> and, uh, um, so overall, like it makes like a learning experience for everyone. So you can just add whatever you want to it or whatever you, whatever you add to it, you get out of it. So anyone can collaborate. Uh, and yeah, so we chose to do a Space Invaders emulator, and you guys can play with that at the end of it. Um, and we wrote it in C. And yeah, I guess without uh, further ado, we'll get started with the talk. Andy will lead the way. Oh, sure, I'll give a little overview of what we're going to discuss. So we're going to talk about a uh, little hit brief history of Space Invaders, and uh, why we chose Space Invaders, and the significance of it. And then more about the, how reverse engineering works, the process behind it, and how we came to reverse engineer space computers to create the hardware and the software and put it all together. So, uh, we'll taking a nice little journey. All right, and I think I'm Josh is going to tell you a little bit about why space. we chose space computers in the first place. Okay, so like I'm assuming everyone you here like at least knows because this is basically going to do what space computers is. Mm -hmm. Basic shooter, the aliens move left and right and move faster in the end. We chose it because it was like ridiculously influential in Japan. Like they were like people made like arcades just for this game specifically. That's how much of an impact yeah. it had. Mm -hmm. Plus it influenced like a bunch of people like Shigeru Miyamoto, Hideo Kojima, and like it started like the golden age of arcade games and shooters. So like yeah, it's just ridiculously influential. Yeah, the first household name. All right, and I don't know what the next slide is. Let's see. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna tell you like what reverse engineering is first. And kind of like have an idea of how we tackle this. So, okay. so reverse engineering is the process of learning a design and product for the uh, the goal of making a new product based on the information we gathered. There are three stages of reverse engineering, coined by Michael R. Blaha: implementation, design, and analysis. All right. So first one. Okay. In our Stage one, we do implementation. This is where we learn about the product or the application. We want to find information about it and existing documentation to learn about what was the purpose of this. In this case, Space Invaders, it was purpose to um, create a game on an arcade cabinet. With that in mind, we can get into the shoes of the creator. We know what to look for, and we know what to create. Step two. Yeah. Uh, this is design. Uh, we could we look for um, anything important in the code. We look for um, keys and data to combine and as they need up the process. Uh, but I created an uh, index of entities we can find in the system, try to reconvict the product or application. It's basically like gathering a bunch of information and stuff. Um, step three. And our last step, analysis. This is where we take all our information we got from our design process and we finally build it together. But not only does the product now work, we have to make it better. We have to optimize it. So when looking at this code, you should get an understanding of what is needed and what isn't. So you can start ripping stuff off to better optimize it. So we can remove redundancies, reduce, um, reduce errors, and make a better product. Yeah, like you see right here, we have, uh, we made our own changes to the game, like um, just basic color, and that would be something we changed. Yeah, and I think the one on the right is actually, might be an official like 2.0 or something, so they basically reverse engineered or upgraded their own, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, we didn't. Normal, good reverse engineers, I guess, would, uh, would do this stuff, this is like, the main reason the reverse engineer is like, hey, I want to make it better. But uh, yeah, we, we're just doing it educationally. <laughs> For now, we might be doing something next semester. Yeah, we'll talk about our next project at the end, so stay tuned. Um, 
next. Yeah. All right. And uh, after we're done finding out the hardware, how it works, of course, we can emulate it. And that's what we want to hear. Yeah, so uh, I'm guessing at least half of you know what emulation is because you showed up. Um, <laughs> anybody like hazy? All right, so yeah, emulation, we're basically just writing code that'll do the task that the hardware originally did. Um, and to do that, oh yeah, actually I have an example of the emulation just in case anyone wasn't super familiar. Does anyone know what an AND gate is? Vaguely familiar? Okay. Uh, yeah, so AND gate is like a hardware piece where you connect like two wires in and if they're both sending voltage into it, then it'll actually output voltage. And if not both of them, if it's just like one or the other, none of them are sending voltage, then there's no output. Uh, and yeah, so you can basically write code to represent what an AND gate actually does. So that's like a really a micro example of emulation, how it can work. You just have to do this on a bigger scale for space makers. So first we need to decide what exactly we need to emulate. So we have to actually look at what's inside space makers. Um, this is the inside of a cocktail cabinet. Um, we're going to go through each components we need to emulate. So for starters, the, the heart and soul of this system is the Intel 880. That's the processor that actually processes the game. Um, takes in all the instructions from the ROM and actually runs the game, basically. So also there's, a, there's some other chips on there, and that's usually just for processing signals and whatnot, or processing signals to go out to the video or something like that. And we'll take a different approach, because we don't actually need to emulate <laughs> that hardware directly because they're not outputting to like a to a tube TV or anything like that. And then the RAM, that's pretty straightforward because most modern coding language will manage memory for you. And if not, manage memory isn't too hard to just allocate it and it's just there. So that's pretty easy. You just basically use your hard drive. Um, all right, and so to understand the CPU or the Intel 880, you basically got to look through this giant manual. And it, it tells you everything about the Intel 880 in and out. So that's sort of a tool that we want to use to tackle that. Uh, next piece inside the machine, that's going to be the soundboard. We didn't get to sound, so we didn't actually really sound. But there is a DIP switch, which basically represents a byte in the data. And depending on which switches you flip on, it'll change attributes in the game. So if you flip one on, it could give you less lives. If you flip it off, it'll give you more lives. Something like that. So the person who owns it could just try to make more money by saying, hey, let's give you one life, so they have to spend more or something. So we did emulate that, because that was pretty easy. Oh, uh, yeah, it did do sound. Um, so here are the ROM chips. This is where the game data is actually stored. Uh, each ROM chip is two kilobytes. So if you were to ever find like a dump of this ROM, it would be four separate files. Yeah. Um, but you could also, some people will combine it all into one big file, one eight kilobyte file if they want. So basically, this is just the data um, that we're going to have to feed into the processor. Uh, first of all, we need to get it. And to do that, you use an EP ROM programmer. So this is what developers would use to program the ROM in the first place. And so if you have it, you can just take the data right off. I mean, this is read-only memory, so if, uh, in the first place, someone had to write stuff to it. So this is how they did it. And yeah, so now we've narrowed down things that we actually care about. The, uh, the, the, the processor, manual. yeah, the processor with the manual, and the actual ROM, like the actual game, and then we have to dump it, right? So where do we actually start from here? Uh, we can start like a different ways, I guess depending on your experience. We were less experienced and obviously this is like an educational thing, so we, what we wanted to do was look <coughs> at the ROM and see what it even looks like in the first place and try to make some sense of it. So that's the direction we went. So we dumped our ROM. Yep, a bunch of garbage <laughs> text. That happened to me the first time too, yeah. I was so confused. So <laughs> if you open it in a notepad, yeah, you get that junk all around the right. And most people are just like, what the heck is this? <laughs> you know? um, but this is all like machine code, basically. So they, we opened it in a hex editor. So each little, I guess, 16-bit hex column, like each column just has a point. So like each little thing here, oh, shoot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you saw it. Uh, um, 
But yeah, so each little section is 16 bits, so that represents one command to the processor. So all this is data, you just, you just need to feed in the processor. But we don't know what any of this means, really. We want to make sense of it, especially at the time that we looked at this. We had no idea. And Joshua made a disassembler. In Java. It it. Yeah. A 90% working disassembler. Okay. That's so wrong. <laughs> Okay, an assembler is basically it turns assembly code into machine code. So like you have all this legible code into like nonsense, zero zero one point zero binary stuff like that. Yeah. And what does a dis what do you think a disassembler does? Yeah. You gotta know what an assembler does to understand. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> okay. Assembler does. Well this assembler does the exact opposite. They return machine code to human readable assembly, which like are a bunch of commands for space and here. Like no OP, no op, right? Yeah. No op <laughs> no OP. No op means like the games for space invaders, like there'll be a bunch of zeros at the very beginning, that means like the game's building up. And then there'll be like commands for, like to move left and right, fires, stuff like that. And for me, um Around yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like it prints out a bunch of commands, but like not all of them for some reason, I don't know why. I mean like multiple, with the help of like everybody else, I mean like multiple for loops for each of the files. And I use input stream to close them out and to read through them. I put everything in the array at first, and like it stops printing out all the bytes. I don't know why, I'm still trying to figure that out. But yeah. It was working at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if everybody wants to see. Yeah, and like like I said before, if you scroll all the way up, you'll see like a bunch of zeros. Well, down here, if you scroll all the way up. You see like a bunch of like a few zeros here. That means like the game's starting to boot up. And like there's a bunch of other commands that mean like left, right, shoot, stuff like that. That's a large array. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so we we really just dumped the entire content into the giant array. Yeah. So it was eight thousand. So it's like. So you knew the uh, opcode because of the 8080 standard? Yeah, so that, that we got from the manual. We'll go over that a little bit more. So basically we made a giant switch statement. It's pretty messy, pretty gross, but yeah, depending <laughs> on what we too. got, we'd output. Like, hey, this is what we had to hard code everything. So if you look at the manual, yeah, I'll get to that in a bit, actually, because I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so yeah. And anyways, this is what it looked like. And this is what a really good documented version of it looks like. So this is actually like Space Invaders code. It's from a courtesy of ChuggerArchaeology.com. It was a great resource because they documented everything. So anytime anything went wrong, I could just look at this and be like, oh, I didn't, I didn't define this instruction or something like that. So like each one, it'll say, hey, this is happening. This is happening. This is happening. Does anyone actually know what's going on here, actually? Kind of. <laughs> um, all right, I'll try to break it down without touching the screen. I didn't realize this is touch screen. It's a smart board. Huh? Smart board. It's too smart. Um, <laughs> no, 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 use the marker. Smart board. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so basically, in the code, this is this section in memory, so you kind of have like a counter of like, or like an index of where each line of code is. It's basically line. Uh, 100. Or, this isn't hex, so it's something else. But as far as you know, it's line 100, and uh, this is like the actual information that gets processed on that line. And you notice it switches from 100 to 103, and that's because this specific instruction, 21, which represents load, uh, it basically says load the next two things stored in memory into this location. So. It's kind of hard. I don't want to get like too low level because this could go on forever. Are you sniffing a bit first? Or? Um, it it, def it flips. So yeah, um, yeah. I guess you've noticed. So it takes this one, puts it there, and that one puts it there. That that drove me crazy halfway through. Like, so I'd, I'd always forget which is what, and then yeah. I have to go back debugging. I had to. Mm. It's crazy, but uh, I don't want to get too into the details because we could talk about this. Forever. Sure. Uh, if you want to know more, just hang out afterwards. Obviously, we'll tell you whatever you want. You can ask questions. Join the club. You know, whatever. Uh, all right. So we took apart our ROM. We got all the data from it. Now we actually have to feed it into something to process it. Right? We have to process that data to run it. So we have to emulate the Intel 
And I got this guy to punch into the computer because this part was absolutely terrible. Yeah. Because <laughs> like um, we're in, like we have a little Discord server for our club, and like he posted like a bunch of errors trying to get it work. For some reason, he got like tilt for it. I guess oh, like, yeah. like tilt to the machine. We weren't supposed to do that back in the day. To, like get money, right? It was. It would jump. Like the, when if you defined specific things badly, like so in assembly code, it jumps all across like where it needs to go. So if you accidentally jump to the wrong line of code, it wouldn't just jump like slightly off. It could go into like the abyss basically. <laughs> so it would just jump somewhere it should never ever touch and start processing these commands that should never be processed. So you'll get all sorts of weird errors. And I think I got a video of one in a little bit. But yeah, so how do we do this? We gotta flip to this thing. Uh, this thing was so many pages. I think there's like it's like 235 because I went through it last time. Oh yeah? Yeah, I could start reading through it. I was like, uh huh, but I got them. So <laughs> it's terrible. In, in those pages, there's at least 200 different instructions or opcodes that we have to manually define in our code. So basically, we had a giant switch statement for every single command, and we went from the start to the bottom going through and say, hey, if this happens, do this. Um, so basically, you had to memorize this. It was pretty brutal. Uh, let me show you. Here's part of the documentation that was from the Intel ADD. So the first thing we wanted to do was sort of create some sort of model with data structure to represent what the actual processor was doing or what data it actually stored. Um, so over there is its registers. It's basically, it's the memory it used. Um, first one, the accumulator, that's sort of its main memory point, 8 bits. And then after that, you got these general purpose registers, which operate in pairs, basically. So you can either read the data from B, or you can read the data from B and C as if it's like one big thing, which is pretty cool. Um, program counter, that's what keeps track of what index you're at all the time. So whenever you jump, you have to switch the program counter to like some more way down. And stack pointer, that kept track of where you to be. So whenever you jump somewhere else, you have to save all your data into the stack so you can grab it later when you jump back. Um, and then flags, that's just a bunch of booleans pretty much depending on what content you have in the accumulator at any time. On the right, there's a little sample. This is oversimplified. It ended up looking a little bit different, um, but I figured this would be the easiest to understand. Uh, so we just defined a little structure called flags. And obviously, if you want to know more about the local code, you can just, because I can talk about this forever. Um, but yeah, so this is a simplified version of what the data structure would look like. The processor state just has all the contents that would be stored in the processor if it was the actual hardware. All right, and here is a list, a very simplified, nice looking list of all the instructions that come out of the book. So the book was huge and it would say everything in detail. This, uh, a guy at Emulator 101 wrote this, and it was pretty helpful. So, it's a list over there on the left is the hex code that you saw earlier, and this is the instruction it represents. And this is actually saying what it would do. So, let's see, this one's the easy one. So, I in X is basically like an increment. Uh, the register pair, that's B, so it increments the whole BC. So I guess a great way to look at that at a high level was like B could have, I don't think this is exactly how it works unless there's a certain flag flipped on, but this is over simplification. So B could contain the number one and C could contain the number two, but you put them together it's 12. Super simplified, it's not actually how it works. But so basically you're either gonna add 12, which would be 13, or you could add to the just B part, well, I guess this is decrement, yeah, that's, that adds to the B part, so that would add to the one instead of to the 12. So, that's something, so this is an example of all the stuff we had to hard code. I think, you on the next slide, have an example. Yeah, here's the giant switch statement, and this is basically what we were doing. Let's see, uh, yeah, this one was actually, I love this one, so this is the one we just looked at where you added one, the BC pair, it's just plus equals one, easy. Um, and then there's more complicated ones like these. Uh, you gotta like store whatever memories directly after the command into the, 
Oh, into PC. Okay, so you take a memory that's stored like in the ROM and just putting it in the registers. So, all right, I shouldn't get too low level. Um, <laughs> again, yeah. Like, you, you want to learn more about it, you can sit behind. Exactly. Play, play the thing too. Yeah, you can just play the game. You don't have to. It's <laughs> the fun part. Um, all right, so we did all that. We got the processor. We got the ROM. ROM is feeding into it, and in theory, it's working perfectly. We, what do we do about the actual screen? We got to display it somehow. So I think initially we used OpenGL. Bad idea. It, you know, you didn't, uh, <laughs> but you couldn't even get it to show up, right? I mean, I got it working, kind of. It's just, it's meant for 3D graphics, so you do a lot more just to write a pixel. It's kind of overkill for what we're doing. So we ended up doing S <laughs> SDL. Yeah, SDL2. Um, Here's also, uh, this is worth noting, so I think I mentioned a while back, there's like seven kilobytes worth of video data or video and stored in the RAM. Um, and this actually drove me a little bit crazy at first because I didn't realize how it was stored in the RAM. Uh, so it's actually stored sideways, which is freaking crazy. Um, this was initially sideways or whatever. You can imagine how it looks sideways. Uh, yes. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, yeah. So basically, it started from down here and like went up that way, and then when it worked its way down, it was stored memory. So it was all stored sideways. So I had to do some like logic to flip it. Um, and each byte had eight bits, and eight, eight bits represent a pixel that would render really directly on the screen. So here's a little example. So if these two bits are on, and that would mean these two pixels are on. So there's a way they like save memory. And that also means that they didn't have any color logic in the first one. So right here, this color, that's a new one. Actually, I think they used uh, tricks on the on the screen or like the overlay to make it look like it had colors. So they'd do like a green tint, and then the rest would be white. So it looked like it had two colors, but it was all just uh, monochrome. So Here's what I ended up having to do, some crazy <laughs> rotate video logic over down the left. And then we did it using SDL, like I said. And what's really cool, it's like, you know how I just said it's monochromatic or whatever, uh, only two colors, but I could actually manipulate the colors since we're doing it in SDL. So after you grab what you need to draw, you can actually change what color you want to have it. So uh, you could just flip whatever you want here. And you can even, um, Add a little bit more to the logic and like say, hey, if this is at this part of the screen, draw like this color and vice versa. So we could actually play around with the color a little bit. Um, it's not hard coding, so it's not the best way. It won't, the color won't be consistent necessarily unless you tie it to specific commands in the code. Uh, let's see what's next. Okay, yeah, so you'd think we're done here, but we're not. Uh, there's actually some hardware interrupts that the machine used, uh, specifically video interrupts. So basically, when it was rendering the bottom half of the screen, it would update the top half. And then vice versa, when it's rendering the top half, it would update the bottom half. So that way, there would never be any data being trying to be written to the screen, or like halfway written on the screen when it displays. So it always updates the screen when it's not being rendered. So that way, you don't get half a space later displaying on the screen or anything like that. So that was pretty clever of them. It kind of drove me crazy, because uh, <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. But uh, yeah, to emulate that, that's also really low level, and I really want to get into that. But basically, you're cutting in line. Uh, you, you take instructions, you cut in line of whatever was about to be done, and you say, hey, do this first, and then you finish, and then you go do whatever's next. So now we're done? Not really. Um, let me show you how it worked after that. This is, honestly, I think this is how I was working like a week ago. Uh, you run it, and this is what it did. It's not good. So, any idea what could be going wrong? Anybody wants to take a guess? It's too fast. No, it's not real tight enough. Yeah, it's on point. All right, yeah, so basically, our processor runs way too fast, way faster than the Intel AD. Throttle it. So, yeah. 
here's an example. Um, my processor that I was running on at the time is an i5, three gigahertz, that's 300 billion cycles per second, but the original only did 200 billion cycles per second. Uh, so yeah, it was going way too fast because a lot of the developers back in the day would rely on certain things going slower. They'd be like, hey, during this interrupt, I needed to wait longer just to make sure this other interrupt finishes or something like that. So they would just put extra commands, just like a like the no off you saw. It's like, what good is that? They actually used it to take up time, so there's like a little bit more delay. So it gives other commands time to actually run. They probably weren't going to upgrade the processor on the uh, arcade cabinets anytime soon. So yeah, so they probably weren't worried about it either. Uh, plus, this was like pretty revolutionary, so they actually pushed this thing to its limit. Um, all right, so after that, we would get it working. Yeah, but you can see it over here. Um, so the controls is what really makes this thing feel awesome. Randy designed the controls. I'll have him talk about it. And then we'll wrap it up after that. All right. So have at it. What's my turn? Oh, Hey, my name's Randolph Wilson, or Randy, or hey you, or whatever. <laughs> I designed the controls. Most emulators that most people are used to you use a keyboard or an Xbox controller, that just kind of, that just cheapens the feel of it. So I got a hold of a Switch-based sw arcade stick, which is pretty close to what they would have used originally, which was just two push buttons, left, right, fire, player one, all that fun stuff. I also implemented a coin acceptor, which was actually the more tricky part of all of this. But yeah, uh, original Space Invaders either used a simple joystick or left, right, as I just mentioned. Um, I cheated a little bit. In the original, you would have had the buttons wired up to the board. I took an Arduino, told it to pretend it's a keyboard. So I'm an emulating an emulator. <laughs> We've got meta emulation of the folks. Which, the particular Ar Arduino that I used was the Leonardo that does support emulation of various types of human type interfaces. So you just have to implement USB? Oh, goodness, no. I mean, I could have if I hated myself. <laughs> which, I'm not quite to that threshold yet. Maybe in a year. <laughs> oh. There, uh, no, eh, eh, eh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there it is in mid-production. I actually went through the effort of putting it partly on a proto board and simulating the type of configuration. I guess I couldn't find any hard evidence, but I figured it would have been a pull-up type switch. I couldn't find anything. I didn't own the hardware to actually test it on, so I tried to just do my best. Crypt all the wires, ran everything like a crazy person. And then I implemented the point acceptor, which was actually rather unpleasant. <laughs> one I used was one that can accept multiple coin types. I ended up just choosing one coin type, quarters. So if you have quarters, we would gladly accept the donation. donation. <laughs> yes, yes. We would yeah. love you. Let us buy more stuff. One or quarter not. will let you have more time on the space invaders. Plus right? you'd be our bestie. Yes. Anyway, the point acceptor ends up putting out a pulse that is an analog signal, which took me forever and a half to figure out, and yeah, that's apparently how most arcades work, is they just read an analog signal. How unpleasant. So, yeah, unexciting, excitingness. All right, I think Ryan is yeah. going to talk about the future of the club. Yeah. This has been a, uh, where I show our club a little bit and get you guys to join. So, here's the future of our homebrew club. Uh, we want to focus on teaching people. Uh, I know many people here are new, maybe new to coding, or just um, people that want to interested in picking it up. Uh, so we want to give you resources and to, to do all of this. We want you to make sure that you enter this club uh, a novice or an immediate or a professional and still learn something at the end of the day. And I want to focus on informing people because learning how everything works outside our campus is important. We need to know what happens in the industry and what's happening around us so we can adapt and we can be ready. So we want to give you the recent news in cybersecurity, computer freedom, and um, recent innovations. Also, we want to focus on you. We want to promote people to have their own projects and we want the Homebrew Computer Club to make sure that there are people here that can help you and give you ideas or just be part of the team. So we want you, we want people to help and collaborate on your projects. 
question. Which one do you think is like the veteran of the group? I mean, well, not, it's been it's around. around. <laughs> I just <laughs> it's semester. been around for one semester, so <laughs> it, no veterans really. Or they're like the founding fathers. You I mean guess. like who's been in the industry longer or something? I guess who has the most experience. experience. I've had like five internships, so. Well, from so, that yeah, it wouldn't have been listed. I say that. <laughs> 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 say that part. He's under contract. <laughs> <laughs> not on the contract, not to tell you that, but uh, yeah, um, <laughs> anyways, moving on, you can ask about that later, uh, we're almost done, we want to talk about the next product, see if anybody's interested in, or like has any cool ideas for it, and it, nothing's in stone yet, so take this with a grain of salt, we're probably going to vote on it, maybe like next week or the week after, so if you guys are interested, Side on their project, that'd be cool if you want to join, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and also club meetings are every Friday from 1 to 3, so basically around this time. Yes, same time. Here? Same room. Yeah, same room. Well, sometimes, might be in the other room. yeah, I might be in the room depending if it's in the locked or not. I'll send out emails okay. um, if anyone joins the club, so. <laughs> uh, anyways, our next project is sort of like a super vibe version of this. Uh, uh, arcade cabinet that's not going to have a cardboard and duct tape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we got a cardboard ratchet looking arcade machine over here. We want to build an actual arcade machine made of wood. We have a, a wood shop for the students actually on campus. I think it's on the KSU campus, but oh, architecture building. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Are we? We're allowed to use it, right? I know either the plastic, the 3D printers, or the wood shop. One of them is restricted to us, but either way, we can use I one. I think because we're a student organization, we have more leeway. That's true. I I can make sure of that. Don't worry about it. All right. <laughs> All right. So Andy will take care of them. Uh, so yeah, this is what we want to do. Uh, build an actual arcade cabinet and donate it to the school. We want it to run a Game Boy Advance emulator, which means we have to write that as well. It's still up for debate. We have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to like come vote, add your opinions, we'll probably discuss it for a bit next one. And decide. Oh, your experience with that. A regular Game Boy would be a lot closer than a Game Boy. I know, because it's almost the same processor too, so it'd be the easiest job for sure. So it just depends on who wants to do what. So if more people want to do this, we'll do that, and vice versa. I know starting from the ground up, I'd be really, it would be nice to do things better the second time. Uh, so I'll be happy about that. But it's also pretty intimidating because this is pretty brutal too, and it was a much older processor. So yeah, we. Uh, I think. So I, I personally want to work on like maybe like a bootloader OS, mini OS kind of thing for the Game Boy emulator. And then I think a few of us want to do ROM hacks. Uh, a little hazy on the legal side, so you can't, <laughs> you can't ROM hack anything that has DRM. You don't want to touch any DRM. Uh, it's all under fair use, so you do have to own the ROM that is one hack. You can't make a profit off this either. Yeah, you can't make any money off it. <laughs> Uh, you can accept donations, but you can't sell it. You can't distribute anything that you do. Uh, you can distribute ROM packs if you want. So we'll go over that more in the future if you want to do that. Um, what is reverse engineering? Uh, no, that reverse engineering is the process of um, breaking down a product or application and the purpose of recreating that information you got. Yeah, so ROM so like, like that. If, if I look okay. uh, okay. <laughs> here, basically we. Uh, Broke down space invaders. You have to learn the, what the space invaders is running on the Intel 80. Okay. So, 80. Just so we it. learned that and recreated it on this. Okay. And then ROM hack could be like a uh, reverse engineering too, because you take the base of like a regular game and change it to like, yeah. you change it to something to put it down. Yeah, you gotta like tear it apart and see how it works to rebuild it yeah. how you want. So it's pretty much it. And it's a lot more work than building it in the first place because you have to look at someone else's code or work and tear it apart and try to make sense of it. And you never know who originally made it, so they can be doing crazy stuff that makes no sense. Um, and I think some of us might want to do make our own ROMs, and also yeah, maybe like an engine. I mean, we got a bunch of different projects, and if you can see anything that you could add to this, um, we're also talking about a mesh network, something just to host information on the a little <laughs> computing club. So there's like a lot of projects, a lot of room for anyone to work on, no matter what technology you're good with. Um, so if you want to be involved, just let us know. You know, we got uh, we got this room for like another hour. So yeah, I mean, after this, you can just ask us for more information or hang out. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
grab some stone ass or whatever. Oh, um, and that is it. Oh, it's like, is, is Owl Life still down? Uh, no, it's back up. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Someone came saw it. No, someone actually saw it there, so. Oh, okay. uh, people checking. <laughs> Is so, it, this is like, uh, is this like official or is it like a... Yeah. Official. Yeah, it's official. Yeah, it's like legit. legit. Uh, next, by fall, we're probably going to be getting the money. Yeah. 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 So we, this hours. club has technically existed for over a year, but we haven't really done anything until last semester. Yeah, we're okay. just, we're just getting going. So yeah. you guys would be like the, the founders. Almost. Yeah, yeah I just, I just want to like, I would just want to be like on my resume. <laughs> 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 At least he's honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You were in what? Oh yeah, this doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wasn't yeah, like I remember just being called like the Happy Club at first, right? Yeah, we're called the Happy Club. Stupid. Yeah. Hey guys, how like hack face? All right. So we have like sixty plus members technically on the website because we were known as a hacking club originally, uh, but we have the wrong kind of people want to join. So we had to change that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it caught my attention. Yeah. I was like, these guys really can't be saying they're the hacking club well, when they're on campus. I and it's like the school knows about this. <laughs> well, technically, there already is one, but it's for like the security um, networking guys, I think. Yeah. But they're like the business. Uh, offensive penetration or something like that. Or, yeah. That's, that's not, not bad. bad. That's not <laughs> bad. <laughs> Penetration <laughs> testing or something. Yeah. God. Whatever. Um, <laughs> What's the defense? Uh, offensive defense. Something like that. Basically, <laughs> you find holes in. <laughs> find <laughs> holes and you attack them. <laughs> find <laughs> holes in the network and you, you, you figure out what everything is going on from the outside. <laughs> Alright, you guys get the picture. Alright. Um, any questions? <laughs> Just out of curiosity, did you ever figure out why the original developers? encoded the graphics sideways? Like, what was their rationale? I'm sure it wasn't just to make you angry. It might have been because, like, the CRT was sideways, mm -hmm. so it could just be, it's like, easier just to throw it out. But with STL, it, the X and Y axis was, like, different. So we actually start from the bottom. Yeah, bottom to the right, right side up. So we <laughs> had to rotate everything. Which actually, yeah, I guess I did a tiny bit of wait and see because you actually had to go through the logic. But so it was hardware dependent why they did it in the first place, and when you emulated it with different hardware. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> might have been better ways to go about it, but yeah. it works. So yeah, I can explain. And so so like, also we've only got to the second level, so we don't know what lies beyond. It can so crash. You get past. <laughs> yeah, it might crash. Who knows? But if you get past the second level, we'll know. Because we only implemented like two interrupts, I think there's like seven. The other ones aren't supposedly crucial. Um, you'll notice in the bottom right corner, I think the, uh, the credits doesn't update right. Um, I can't imagine. I don't want to believe that that's an interrupt that handles that, but maybe, maybe it is. Uh, I have no idea why it's not working. And you'll see if you ever go look at documentation on people who write emulators and random games don't work. A lot of the times they'll just write, we have no idea why this doesn't work. And pretty much the same here. I understand them now, so. <laughs> Any more questions? Fill the code for this somewhere. Okay, so we're going to upload it to Git. We're going to start on GitHub soon. I'm not proud of the way the code looks right now, so. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to get some commits on GitHub, they can just help clean up a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, I'll clean it up at least a little bit initially, and then. Because I mean, right now it's well, mostly in one file, so it's like really tightly coupled, and I kind of want to tear it apart. And I want to make sure that I don't accidentally distribute the wrong. Because that's it. so. Yeah, wait for that. And if you join the club, then you'll get like an email, and I can send it out like a week. Yeah, you know, so we have a Discord server too. That'll be like two years public. We do. Oh, if you guys want to join that. Um, any other questions? Where is all of that? You showed us. Uh, so this is just a Surface Pro right here, and it's just running the application. Oh, so you're just, okay. Yeah, and then this like all the, the There's like a cool stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that yeah. stuff they showed, they pulled the data out of it, 